This is sure to leave pitbull stations pooing in their pants. Let's begin. According to this article, a new scheme will ensure that fuel retailers must share any new petrol or diesel pricings within 30 minutes of a change. Now, obviously, that doesn't sound like such a big deal, does it? But if just think about it. If you're one of these expensive petrol stations and you know that a little bit down the road is a far cheaper one and customers have the ability to go on a website or an app maybe, who knows, might even be able to give that customer a notification that a petrol station nearby has reduced their prices and is now 10p cheaper than what you are, that could actually have quite a massive effect on your profits, couldn't it? Which is actually a good thing for us drivers. Because let's face it, how often do we hear nowadays petrol stations say something like, oh, I'm sorry, old boy, but you know, there's been a little bit of an accident in the sea, and because of that, the fuel is going to be 11p dearer than what it is is now oh dear what a shame well the thing is this will massively backfire on that and will surely make them think twice before raising any of their prices at all won't it the article goes on and says that information shared by the fuel sector will be collected by a single body as part of a pump watch scheme and this this is what we've all been asking for isn't it it's about time we had some sort of government body or organization to control or keep an eye on these so-called price rises if they are actually needed or required or not And the best bit is the live data will then be made available to tech companies to develop price comparison tools that can be shareable via sat-nav system. So you can even be on your way to a petrol station and it will say something like, oh, you're on the way to this one, but this one is much cheaper and it's literally down the road. Do you want to go there instead? And your wallet will go, yes, please. But it's just not sat-navs, it is also smartphone apps and apparently websites too. Although, let's face it, I might be a teeny weeny bit hasty on the amount because the pump watch price comparison scheme could apparently save motorists 3p per litre of fuel, according to this, ministers say. Although it does say that the move follows the successful use of the Consumer Fuel Council price checker in Northern Ireland, with prices in the nation usually being about 5 pence cheaper per litre compared to the rest of the UK. Well, personally, I don't think that's fair. But hopefully something like this will make all that change, eh? Especially, of course, if drivers pull up to the petrol station, see the map and go, "Mm, no, thank you, I'll go down here. Apparently, though, at the moment, pricing data is only made available the following day, meaning that information provided is often out of date when motorists want to fill up. Petrolprices.com currently has an app that provides the rates a day earlier. But the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero DIS, says there, is called, or DSNZ, says that by providing live forecourt price and information, drivers can instantly and more accurately identify the cheapest fuel in their locality and research the best places to fill up for longer trips to unfamiliar areas. Well, thanks for stating the obvious, eh? But either way, that is certainly good. Data from REC Fuel Watch shows that petrol prices cost an average at the moment of 139.89 pence per litre, whilst drivers of diesel vehicles pay slightly less than £1.48 per litre. There are some 12, in fact, petrol stations, including the big four supermarkets, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's and Asda, have apparently signed up for an interim voluntary scheme launched by the competition watchdog to share their prices daily. It's about time, isn't it? Ministers have also now said that the dating sharing scheme is now being consulted on and it will be a legal requirement. So there's no getting out of it, garages. For far too long, it's seeming that they've had an unfair advantage. And to be honest, it does make me wonder if when a 2035 ban on new petrol diesel cars comes into an effect, it just makes me wonder until then if they're trying to get some sort of additional profit coming in until then then they would otherwise be entitled to but let's face it once all these evs are out on the road then not many people are actually going to need petrol and diesel are they and yes i know obviously when 2035 comes in not everyone is going to go over to evs and personally i don't think they should be forced to we should only get an ev if and when we choose it's right for us not you government you need to sort that out it's not fair that people especially if they want a new car should feel forced into doing that But at the end of the day, that surely is going to put a wrench or spanner into the works of the petrol station. So I guess they're just going to try to get as much money as they can until then. But then again, of course, yeah, I could be wrong. You know, I think if Keir Starmer done any more U-turns, he'd probably be a ballet dancer. It seems like every other week, doesn't it, we hear that Labour's doing some sort of U-turn on a policy or sitting on the fence or doing whatever, apart from actually, it seems, 
making proper decisions and using things like Twitter as their advisors when in my opinion they should actually listen to the public not these woke lefties that they often seem to listen to and yes I know they are kind of on the left thinking side but if they want to be in power which smells at this rate they more than likely certainly will be unfortunately in my opinion they really do need to sort themselves out but this time their U-turn might actually be a good thing for common sense that is because apparently they have actually scrubbed £28 billion of eco spending pledge from their campaign Bible after a row over some and that's surely a good thing isn't it 28 billion pounds of our tax money was going to go into this sort of crap and finally they've actually hopefully realized that there are more people in the uk than just stop oil idiots and personally i think they actually might be u-turning for another reason entirely and that is because toy treasury ministers last night accused Keir Starmer of plot on tax rises to pay for this eco crap and apparently the Labour Party failed to mention the figure in this new election memo to MPs, despite, of course, claiming the massive green splurge is fully funded. And one of the Labour's central messages, or promises rather, is to switch on great British energy with a raft of investment into power sources. That includes more than doubling the nation's onshore wind capacity, tripling solar output and creating brand new publicly owned energy company but of course the 24 page brochure was sent out to Labour MPs yesterday to gear up for the election year but they were scant in details about how it would be funded well there's no surprise there it's the Labour Party isn't it how often does it seem like they create all these wild pledges or promises or whatever but they never do really seem to actually sit there with a calculator and add it all up do they they just think no um I'll tell you what just put up tax a little bit they won't notice but I'm telling you what Labour we do notice and we are at the moment, us public I mean, in a bit of a rock and a hard place because if you're like me, you definitely don't want Labour to get in. Because let's face it, if they get in, I'm sure they will go fully woke and may even, I don't know, make something like pronouncing someone's pronouns wrong as a criminal offence or whatever, some sort of woke crap like that. But I don't really want Rishi to get in either because he is not, in my opinion, a conservative. And also, I, like many other people, do not like what he did to Boris. And therefore, he is, in my opinion, a backstabber. And I just can't vote for a backstabber. I'm sorry, Rishi, but you brought it on yourself. It was in a stark comparison, though, to some other pledges, such as rising non-doms to pay for the NHS and whacking VAT on private schools for education spending. But it totally admitted the £28 billion annual spend and figure, which Labour has already downgraded to kick in to the second half of its first term. Labour officials, though, they have said that the pledge would be met by a combination of borrowing, there's a surprise, private investment and existing government money. The thing is, though, that word there, private investment, do you know how often did we hear that come up in COVID, where a mate of a mate would get a really good deal for supplying certain things, and it just makes me wonder, I know it's a different party, but it just makes me wonder if this would be a similar thing. A Labour Party spokesperson added, though, that the Labour Party is of fiscal discipline. All of our policies are fully funded, in line with our fiscal rules, and don't involve any taxes on working people. Oh, shit. Oh, sorry, um, i cough there. But now, of course, they've completely U-turned and scrapped it, it seems. So, um, I guess it didn't make much sense to you, did it, Labour? Maybe, actually, why don't you do us all a favour and completely scrap your party in general? In fact, let's face it, the Conservatives could do the same and we could actually get reform come in and therefore not only have a proper Brexit, but also do things in a much better way, in my opinion. But let's face it, the way this two-party system is, so they've got about as much chance as that happening as Keir Starmer putting on the two to himself and doing a U-turn in it. Something like this makes a complete mockery of our driving licence because, obviously, we're allowed 12 points, aren't we, on our licence? And you'd like to think that is a deterrent not to actually drive like a bell end. And obviously, if you then use up your 12 points, you could even get banned or whatever else. And that that is mainly for safety reasons, isn't it? You can't go around driving like a complete idiot and put people's lives at risk. But one driver, according to this article, Bill Al Abdullah, I think that says, has clocked up not 12, not 24 points, but a whopping 408 points on his license. It just makes me wonder why um, Bill Al Abdullah, if I think that says his last name is, is, is still getting away with this. I wonder if... Um, there could be some reason for that, you know. Um. Anyway, according to the article, a bungling delivery driver has paid the price in the shape of 408 points on his licence for not keeping customers waiting. Bilal Abdullah was caught speeding on the job no fewer than 68 times, presumably making him very popular among Britain's fast food chains, but not obviously 
popular for his driving licence, and it says that he was on his Honda and Yamaha bikes, I think they mean, clocked by speeding cameras which have caught him travelling up to 51 miles an hour in a 30 zone, with over 60 times on various speed cameras around Brighton and Hove. And police sent him notices intended prosecution to Abdullah multiple times for incidents between March the 20th and July the 17th, but the daring driver did not respond and presumably in that time he's just allowed to carry on and yes i know admittedly it can be quite easy to go one or two miles an hour over about 51 in a 30 there's just surely no excuse for that is there and therefore either a police officer or even a governing body should have scrapped his license it carries on and says learn the driver no surprise there abdullah did not appear at brighton magistrates court earlier this month either snubbing the order to appear where he was handed six points per penalty for his offence and in total, the driver received 480 points with six points for each of the 68 offences clocked up and handed out to the 25-year-old. And allegations of speed and no were withdrawn by police as they could not prove the driver in the footage. But the delivery driver has since been banned from driving for two years and was fined a thousand pounds. I know it says that he didn't actually respond to the intended notices of prosecution, but they shouldn't have waited, in my opinion, for him to do 68 offences of speed and before. I don't know, basically putting them all together. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? If he didn't respond to them, then surely they should have had them anyway. This idiot, in my opinion, would therefore have been banned from driving much sooner and therefore wouldn't have been allowed to carry on until, of course, they decided to lump them all together to one court case. Because let's face it, if they had done it sooner, he wouldn't therefore even had the opportunity to get those 68 offences in the first place, would he? 